For the last video here, we're going to talk about some of the implications of local adaptation to some very timely topics. We'll talk about specifically in relation to climate change and also conservation. So if we think about climate change, first of all, and the options that organisms have that are experiencing climate change, they either can move, adapt, or die. That sounds kind of not very optimistic, but in many cases, those are the options. We don't want that to happen. So let's focus in this video on the move or adapt options and how local adaptation might play a role in that. So in terms of movement, one thing we know is that climate change is causing poleward geographic range shifts. So that's what's illustrated in this graphic here on the right. The figure is showing the range shifts for different types of marine species, with a, one of the main takeaways from this figure being that species that are living along the equator where it's warmer, they're the ones experiencing the largest geographic range shifts towards the poles to try and track their suitable habitat. So climate change is definitely causing this poleward geographic rain shift. And where local adaptation comes in, previously it was thought that rain shift predictions based on these climate envelope models would actually underestimate the extinction risk in locally adapted populations. So basically, if you're not taking local adaptation into account, you're going to underestimate how much local extinctions or how at risk these populations are. The problem that leads to this is if you assume every population has the same environmental niche. So let's say we have a hypothetical, exa hypothetical example here, population one, let's use a different color, and population two. If we think about the thermal tolerances of these two populations, say they are the same species but they are locally adapted, Population 2 has a thermal tolerance of 34 degrees C. Population 1 has a thermal tolerance of 39 degrees C. If you're using a climate envelope model based on the more thermally tolerant species, you're going to say, okay, this species as a whole is going to be okay until we reach 39 degrees C. But really that's not true because this population is locally adapted and they can tolerate, tempers that are, tolerate temperatures that are lower than that. So that's what I mean by saying that by not taking local adaptation into account, we can actually underestimate the extinction risk for these locally adapted populations. So that makes sense. But then when I was teaching this last year, a paper came out that said the exact opposite of what I just told you. And what this paper found is that by taking adaptive genetic variation and local adaptation into account, you can actually adjust the opposite way. So in other words, not taking into account local adaptation actually overestimates species loss, which is the opposite of what I just explained in the previous example. And so what they found, and this is actually a paper that we've used for some quizzes previously, this data set, they were looking in general, but also in particular at this case study with two cryptic species of bats, which are shown here. But what they found is that when you take into account this adaptive genetic variation that causes local adaptation, some of that adaptive genetic variation can actually spread between populations similar to a genetic rescue effect. They also emphasize that for this to be able to happen though, landscape connectivity and gene flow is essential. So I don't know exactly whether to tell you that not taking into account local adaptation will overestimate or underestimate species loss in climate change, but my overall point is that either way we have to take local adaptation into account or our estimates of climate change associated extinctions are going to be inaccurate. Either way, local adaptation definitely plays a role and needs to be accounted for. When we're thinking about adaptation and the potential for species to adapt to these new temperatures associated with climate change, for instance, 
it's important for us to figure out which process is causing the phenotype differences that we see. It's possible that it could be due to local adaptation, which is different genotypes leading to different phenotypes, or it could be from this process of phenotypic plasticity, which is where you have one genotype that leads to different multiple phenotypes depending on the environmental situations. And that's important as I will illustrate here. So in this graphic, I have the caption shown down here for reference. I know that it's a lot of text and you don't have time to read it. If you want to pause the video and read it now, you can, but I'm mostly putting it there for you for reference so you can refer to it later. But I'll walk us through everything. So in this graphic, let's first consider that plasticity, which is again, a single genotype causing multiple different phenotypes. Let's assume that plasticity is the process that's occurring here. In this graphic, we have two different populations at different latitudes. This y-axis is temperature, and we have two different hypothetical temperature scenarios. We have the current temperature and then the future projected temperature. For both of these populations, one and two, a population is going to be able to survive in these future temperature conditions if any of their tolerances fall above this dotted future line. So in this case, we can see that there's a broad range of phenotypes facilitated by plasticity. So the box plot of tolerances for both of these populations is relatively large, and both of them have some tolerances above that future temperature line. So in this case, under the process of plasticity playing a large role, both of these populations are going to be able to survive even in these future temperature conditions. However, a process of local adaptation, which is now shown here on the right, is going to lead to a narrow range of phenotypes. So if you look now, it's the same scenario with temperature, future, and current, and different, latit different populations at different latitudes. But what's different now is that the range of those tolerance phenotypes, the box plots, it's much more narrow. And what that means is now under the future temperature conditions, neither of these populations have any tolerances above that line. So in this case, with a narrow range of phenotypes facilitated by local adaptation, both of these populations are going to become extinct. What is important to note here, though, is that this population, too, could hypothetically survive if it had some gene flow from population 1. So this, again, brings us back to the point of that bat paper we discussed a few slides ago where it's possible for adaptive genetic variation to spread between populations if the pathway for connectivity is there. And this also brings us back to that topic of gene flow we talked about previously and why it's so important for populations to maintain their fitness in these different environments. And then lastly, in this video and in this module, let's talk about how local adaptation can also affect the success of different types of conservation management strategies. So first, let's think about this scenario of captive rearing. So say you have a population that has gone locally extinct in the wild or it's not doing very well, and maybe you want to bring them into some kind of controlled environment to help the population then maybe release them back into the wild later. In a captive rearing environment, it's important to think about potential local adaptation to food sources, for instance. Maybe one population eats a specialized diet that other ones don't, and you might not know what to actually feed them when you're bringing them in. The image shown here is a fritillary butterfly. This actually happened, I believe it's an example I've used previously, where in different populations in Europe, only some populations were locally adapted to be able to utilize this quote-unquote lesser food source or not as good food source. So it's important to think about when you're doing a captive rearing situation what the potential diets are and whether local adaptation is playing a role there. Another potential 
avenue for local adaptation to affect conservation is in terms of habitat restoration. So here, oftentimes we need to think about what potential habitats to restore to then bring species and populations back into that habitat. If a site has heavy metals, for instance, if you restore it, not all plants or fungi are going to be able to do well there. So here I have an image of several types of mushrooms because I've actually found with this species, there are some populations that are zinc tolerant if they're within about five kilometers of a zinc smelter, which is a factory that converts things to pure zinc. That's what I looked up. I didn't know that before that. But if you go just 15 kilometers away, those populations are zinc sensitive. So again, local adaptation can play a role in thinking about what habitats are good to restore and what populations to move into that habitat. Are they going to actually be able to survive there? And then lastly, the third example I'll talk about here is introduction into new locations. So this is often called translocations or something we'll talk about later in the conservation genetics lecture. But the idea here is that you're maybe wanting to move populations into new locations, but again, you have to think about, do they use different food sources? Do they have different tolerances to environmental conditions like temperature? Are there interactions with other species like predators or prey that are unique to one habitat and will not translate well to another one. So I really like this example here. I use a lot of local adaptation examples with abiotic factors like temperature. This example here is actually an example of biotic factors causing local adaptation. So these little guys are lava lizards that are found in the Galapagos. And there are two different types of habitats on this island where these lizards live. One of these habitats, which is what's shown at the bottom, have this dense vegetation. And so the lizards that live here are essentially what I like to call hide and seek experts. So they have a lot of cover, they are slow, they hide a lot. And these are all behaviors in response to predators. So these are um, anti-predator, predator avoidance behaviors. In contrast, on the other side of the island, they have habitats that are really open and look like this. And the lizards that live here are what I like to call cautious speed demons. So they're really wary, but when they go, they go. They have really high sprint speeds, they can run really fast, they have really high endurance. So in this sparsely vegetated habitat, it's important for them to have these characteristics. Being a hide and seek expert is not good for them because there's nowhere to hide. And so if you think about these different populations that have local adaptations and their predator avoidance, if you were trying to populate a new island, for instance, and you took individuals from the dense habitat and put them in this sparse vegetation, they're not going to survive. They're going to get eaten because they don't have the behaviors to survive in that environment. So it's another example of how it's important to think about is local adaptation happening and how is that going to affect and potentially reduce the success of this management strategy that we are proposing.